Sure, go ahead. Yep. Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, nice to see you all and more. Uh, there are some people that may not have been here last week. Uh, who are they? They can get on a sheet like this. George was Anyway, I'm here. Anybody else? Uh, you gave me. I, I gave got you already. Everybody else me. got him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Here, yeah. You were here. Yeah. All right. Tonight yeah. we'll be a little bit more involved than uh, last uh, time, uh, where we just talked about resistors and parallel and series resistors and various other things. Tonight we're going to be talking about inductors and capacitors. First of all, what are inductors? Any piece of wire is an inductor. Even if you take a straight piece of wire, like this little piece of wire is an inductor. In, in electronics and radio systems, any piece of wire is an inductor. It has inductance. So you don't always have to think in terms of uh, a wound up wire from a transformer or a coil or something like this. This is a special inductor. As you can see, it's got a big coil here, and it's got another one right around it on the outside, which is smaller in length, but bigger in diameter. That's a special inductor that I make myself. OK, first of all, wire going, a wire that has a current going through it, a DC current. As soon as you start the current flowing, the wire will have a magnetic field around it. OK, it creates a magnetic field. I'm sure you maybe in school you have uh, uh, seen that experiment where they have a wire and they turn the voltage and the current on and there was a, a compass needle and all of a sudden the compass needle pointed towards the wire because that magnetic field was much stronger locally than the Earth's magnetic field and the compass needle immediately turned on to it. Okay? So magnets are strong. I got a very strong here, and I can show you magnetism of this magnet. Look at that. You see this little meter here? See how it deflects? And I'm quite a distance away. Okay, can we see all that? This is a special meter that detects the magnetic field. It's very strong. There we go. I always put that on it. It keeps up. That keeps the magnetism in there. If you want to set, you find yourself a nice magnet, you take an old CD-ROM drive and you take it all apart and you will find pieces of equipment in there like this. That's a very, very strong magnet. Okay? If you put that on a filing cabinet on the side, you're going to have some difficulty removing it. Very strong magnet. Anyway. The uh, straight wire, and we apply a voltage to it, which will then provide a current going through the wire, and there will be a magnetic field being created. The magnetic field is circles around the wire. So if you look at it from the end, you see magnetic fields, and in the center is the wire. Now with a DC voltage or DC current, the moment we apply the current, the magnetic field builds up, and once the current is stabilized, that magnetic field is there and it remains there, and it is stable. Now which way does the magnetic field turn? There is a very handy explanation in the book, it's called the left hand rule. We take a piece of wire like this, and you put your left hand on it, and you point your thumb in the direction that the current is flowing, then the way your hand is, that's how the magnetic field is rotating around. Okay? Now, the way the current flows, we know, right, is from negative to positive. If we want to apply the left hand rule here, I should have drawn this, of course, this way, negative, positive. So in this way here, the magnetic field rotates this way. If you were to reverse the polarity, of course, it's going the other way. You have to 
go this way. So, just remember that. There may be something on the exam about that. Okay. Now with the DC current, fine. We have a magnetic field, and that's interesting. And when we turn the power off, the magnetic field disappears again. It doesn't disappear. Remember I said last week, energy cannot be destroyed. Energy is transformed in a different way. Either transforms into heat or whatever. But a magnetic field like this, what happens when we turn the power off, the magnetic field is called, it collapses. It goes from a larger field all of a sudden to a small and then nothing. But with that, a very special thing occurs. Because the wire is here, and the magnetic field is changing, it will induce a current into that wire. And it's fast, but if we were to physically slow it down to show it, the moment you turn the switch off on the power supply to this wire, the magnetic field would start collapsing smaller and smaller and smaller, and by doing so, it induces a voltage into this wire that runs without the help of our power supply. Now, it's very fast. The moment you turn it off, it, boom, it's gone. But there is a current being, a voltage being induced in that wire. Is there a direction to it, to the induced voltage? The well, same the, direction as the, current? The, the induced voltage here tries to keep the existing current flowing in the same direction. Okay? When we get to the AC, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. Now, a wire by itself produces a very weak magnetic field, not very strong enough. So what can we do to make the magnetic field stronger? There's first of all one way, increase the current, to increase the voltage, which then will increase the current, and that makes a stronger magnetic field. But there is another way of doing it, and that is to wind the wire into a coil. Start here with the wire, we make it in the coil, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, etc., etc. Now, the magnetic fields around it are being added together in the area where the coils are, and the strength of the magnetic field is determined again by three factors. First of all, the strength of the current. Secondly, by the amount of windings we have, whether we have five windings or 50, it makes a big difference, and how close the windings are together. In this coil here, where the windings are fairly far apart from each other, we will get a strong magnetic field, but not as strong as if I were to squash this coil together, this coil together so that they're almost touching each other, the magnetic field would be much stronger. If we take a coil like this one, I'll send it around. This is an inductor. It has uh, inductance, which is a term of the uh, reactants, which we'll come to later. So there you see is a small coil with the wire wound into, circ into circles and tightly. The only what the thing that keeps it from shorting is the insulation on the wire. So that would produce a fairly amount, strong amount of a magnetic field current. So that's with DC. Now, as I said earlier, when we apply the voltage or the current, the magnetic field builds up. But it's <coughs> building up slowly because the inductance of this coil is actually trying to push back prevent that current from increasing to a maximum value. So it actually, it's holding back, it's inducing a voltage that kind of goes against the initial current flow. That's when it reaches its maximum is when the current is flowing in one level, a DC voltage, DC current. Then it doesn't change. The only time it changes the current induced in the wire <coughs> when the magnetic field is changing 
or if we move a wire in and out of a magnetic field. Okay? More students. Okay, find yourself a spot. Okay, there is uh, various other ways to uh, make the magnetic field stronger. Uh, as I said, the amount of windings, the size of the winding, how close the windings are together, and of course the strength of the current. But we can increase the magnetic field in a coil by putting a core in there. <coughs> Stick a piece of metal in there. And what that piece of metal does, it actually makes the magnetic field stronger. Okay? It puts them closer together, so that builds it up. There's different kinds of cores. There's an iron core, and there are, you could use an aluminum core, but it wouldn't do too much. And there's other cores that we'll talk about in a moment. All right, now what happens when we have an AC voltage? We'll just draw a single wire and we put an AC voltage in through here. And we'll call that positive here and negative. And the wave travels, half of it travels from the right left to right, and the other half travels from right to left. An AC voltage is a varying voltage that goes from a zero <coughs> to a maximum positive. Then it starts to go down back to zero, this is the line. And then it starts to go back maximum again, but negative in the opposite direction. And then it goes back to zero, and it goes on and repeats itself. And the AC stands for alternating current. It alternates the current. So the first <coughs> half of the cycle, the current flows, let's say, in that direction. And the second half of the cycle, it flows in this direction. So an AC current goes back and forth. Remember what I said, a magnetic field is actually introduced, especially when the magnetic field is either changed by a varying voltage, or if a wire is being moved back and forth into a magnetic field. Since this voltage is varying from positive to negative, it induces a strong magnetic field. When it initially starts, it will go to a maximum. The induced current is trying to oppose the buildup of this current and voltage. It's actually working against it. When it reaches the top, so that takes a finite time, when it reaches the top and it goes back down to zero, he says, hey, you know, I put all this stuff in here now. I want to keep it going. So now the induced current and voltage is going in the same direction, and it tries to keep this going. Okay, called self-inductance, the inducement of a current into a coil or a wire. If we change the magnetic field, it's called self-inductance. So, imagine that you are sitting at the bottom of the hill, and you have your car, and you push on the accelerator, and now you're going to start going up the hill. Or you're going to push on the accelerator a little bit heavier to make the way going up to the hill uh, at a decent rate, because you're fighting against gravity. So that is that induced voltage and current that is trying to oppose the buildup of the voltage and the current from zero to maximum. So look at this as the hill. Now you get to the top of the hill and you have put all that energy that the engine produced into the car to overcome the gravity force and get to the top of the hill. Now you're at the top and you say, okay, great, now it's easy going from here on. But, you know you cannot exceed the speed limit. So you're going to have to keep the speed the same, right? But gravity says, hey, you know, you put all this power that you put in with the engine in here. I want to make use of that. So the gravity is pulling you, pulling you. It tries to keep you going, makes you go faster. 
that is that current that is being induced when it goes from maximum to zero. It tries to keep it going by inducing a current that flows with the existing current. So that gravity is trying to help you to go fast. And it tries to keep you going. Again, unfortunately, because of the speed limit, you have to apply the brakes. But in this case, we, uh, we just let it go. It happens. So when you have a magnetic field, and in this case, we're not talking about, of course, our engine that is fed gasoline and the explosions create the power. When we increase the current, we build up that magnetic field. When we get to the top, now the current does not change. Here it changes from zero to maximum. At the top, it does not change. Remember what I said, this, there's no change in current. The magnetic field is there, but it doesn't change either. It stays there. So now it's going to go downhill. What makes this one to keep going? Remember that magnetic field we build up? The energy that we put in there, it's now going to collapse. That magnetic field is going to collapse. That creates again energy in the form of a current that flows in the same direction and that includes it and tries to keep it going. So there we go. Energy cannot be destroyed. Energy that we use to create the magnetic field to go to the maximum. Now that magnetic field, because we're going down back to zero, it collapses, it induces a current in there that adds to it. And that magnetic field is now back in the surface. So we haven't lost any energy. We created the energy. Here it stopped. And the energy came back because the magnetic field collapsed. Does that make sense? OK. George, baby? George, right? Here. OK, there you go. So various things to keep in mind. Magnetic field is created by flowing an electric current through a wire or a coil. We can create a current in a wire by moving it through an existing magnetic field. If we have a magnet like this one, fairly strong magnet, has a magnetic field around it. If I take a wire and I move it back and forth through that magnetic field, it induces a current into that wire. Okay. If we induce if we put current through the wire, it creates a magnetic field. Alrighty. Another thing that we can do with uh, right here. So we have everybody has heard of a transformer. Symbol of a transformer is like that. And there is a core in there. Usually it's drawn with the various stripes. That means that it is a metal core, an iron core, in very thin layers. So now we apply a voltage here, we, whether it is an AC current or a DC current. Initially, with the DC current, when we start it, it builds up a magnetic field. Once it's built up, it sits there. It doesn't do anything. The magnetic field is there. This one will produce a voltage on the output because the magnetic field that is being built up here, since it is changing to go from minimum to maximum, it will also induce a voltage and current in this, in this winding. At the moment that the current reaches its maximum and it flows steady, there's no change in the magnetic field, there's no voltage or current induced in the secondary winding. This winding is called the primary, and this winding is called the secondary. Could be the other way around too, you turn this transformer around, then this winding becomes the primary and this becomes the secondary. Usually the, the winding where the power is applied to the source is called the primary winding. The winding where the current and voltage is being induced into by the magnetic field okay. is called the secondary. Okay, I have a transformer that I took apart. It's not a very big one. 
But if you look at it, I cut half of it away, and if you look at it, you can see the various laminations, the iron core, here you can see it even better. They're all thin plates and with insulation in between, either impregnated paper, impregnated in oil, or very, very thin uh, layers of plastic. Why do you think we do that? Since the changing current here and the magnetic field induces a voltage in this secondary winding, what keeps it from inducing a voltage and current into the metal core? Because that is also a closed circuit. So it induces that in two, in this as well. That creates losses. And again, energy doesn't get lost. It'll use energy in here to heat up the core. But that's energy that we miss out on on the secondary because we want to, as much as you can, whatever we put in on this side, we'd like to get the same uh, coming out of the other end. But the core will get that too. And by breaking up the core and making it in, minim, in many lay layers of iron with insulation in between, we reduce the amount of current and therefore we, we reduce the loss. Here's the other half of the core that I cut off. You can see the laminations in there too. Okay, uh, it says here on page 4 to construction of the coil, the more turns per unit length, the stronger is the magnetic field. As I said, the more turns you have in the coil, the stronger the magnetic field. And uh, the length of the coil and the diameter of the coil. Now that the other thing is to strengthen the magnetic field is by putting the core in there. In this case it is metal, but we can also have uh, different cores and we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, inductors. I said that uh, and, uh, any wire is an inductor. No matter if you take a, take a short piece of wire or whether it's a coil, they're all inductors. I have a very special inductor here. These are all coils that are in series with each other. And this is a, called an RF choke. That's a special one that's used in a power amplifier for a radio frequency, uh, a transmitter. And that is used to feed power to the big power amplifier tube. And that coil has special characteristics. There is some other coils here. There's another one that's a bit smaller. And it is similar. It's separate layers. And here we have a coil that is tightly wound together. So because they are all tightly wound, we have a high number of inductance. And the uh, current has some difficulty to go through there, especially because there's so many windings in there. Tony, what yes. is that choke used for? It's in, used in the, in the plate circuit of a power amplifier to feed the voltage to the plate of the tube of the amplifier, but it prevents the RF from going down there so that the RF goes by it and going on to the next stage or to an antenna. Mm -hmm. You will, uh, you will see that in the other chapter about transmitters. I don't know how much they go into detail about it. But, uh, just as an aside, here we have an amplifier tube with a plate, a grid, and a filament. And the plate has to be applied with a high voltage, positive voltage. Now, if this is an RF amplifier, and we just put the wire through here like that, and then we go from here further through a capacitor to go to the antenna, well, the RF that is created in here and amplified is, can go there, but it can also go there into the power supply. You don't want that. That creates all kinds of problems. So what we do, we put a very special inductor in there, and it has such a high inductance that the radio frequency cannot go through it. It opposes it so much that it cannot go through it. So it follows the path of the least resistance, 
and instead of going here, which it can, it goes out. So this applies the voltage supply for the amplifier too, but the RF that is being amplified is going this way. It cannot go that way. It keeps it also out of the power supply. So that's a very basic explanation of what that special choke will do. send this around. This is for example is a coil that has a, if you look on the inside on the bottom, you see a gray material that's called a ferrite material. Because this is an RF frequency coil if you put ordinary steel in there, it just won't work. The, the RF is being opposed by it. You have so much losses in the core that it won't work too well. So you need a core that is especially made for RF, and this is adjustable. You can turn the little screw, and it moves that core in and out. Remember I said to induce the current to make it stronger, the magnetic field? You can put a core in there. Well, if you turn this core in and out, you can change the magnetic field in there as well. It's made out of ferrite, and ferrite is, to make it very simple, is nothing but glue with particles of metal inside, all bunched up in the glue. So you do have metal in there, but it's all very fine, fine particles, and that's called a ferrite. Here's another special inductor, it's called a toroid, which is a core that is made of ferrite and there's wires wound around it. We will read into that book as well about toroid. So the, the effect of the core can be more or less depending on the type of material and it's called permeability, it changes the permeability of the inside of the, of the coil by changing the magnetic uh, field. Can we think of anything else with uh, that we could make use of that magnetic field in a coil? What do you have? Yeah? If you raise the current, then won't you have to use less uh, like things to drive the current in the air so you could like take advantage of the pressure? Well, I was thinking more along the line, what would we use a coil with magnets? What would we use it for? Doorbell. Yeah, an electric magnet, doorbell, relays in your car, your Ignition coil and a relay circuit. And a relay circuit, of course. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I was thinking of, you ever been in the scrapyard where they have a crane that's got a rope or a chain and on the end is this big round thing? That is a huge magnetic, electromagnetic. The cable going down will apply a, a voltage, a current. So he just moves that thing to a pile of rubbish, steel, and he turns the switch. And the current starts flowing and you get a strong magnetic field and he picks up a whole bunch of steel, carries it over to the bin where it has to be crushed. He turns the current off, turns the switch off and the magnetism disappears and all the steel falls down. That's a good example how you can make good use of a strong magnetic field. Okay? All right. <coughs> Remember we said we can uh, change the amount of inductance of a coil, which is called, the term for inductance is called Henry. And uh, Henry is a fairly large figure. So in other coils, like small cores, uh, coils, we talk more about an inductance of milli Henry and even micro Henry. So depending on the size of the coil, uh, the inductance will be either large or small. Now, if I have an inductor here, and let's say it is uh, 20 millihenry, but I need one that is 30 millihenry. What can we do? I cannot do anything with this. It's fixed. It's you know, it's made. I can't do anything with it. So I go through my junk box, like we do in resistors, and I find another one of 10 millihenry. 
These numbers, 10 millihenry. What do we do to make a coil of 30 millihenry? Put them in series. Does that remind you of what we did with resistors? So the formula for inductance inductors in series is the same as the one with resistors in series. You add them together. So instead of saying it is so many ohms, we say now the 20 millihenry coil adding to it a 10 millihenry coil now becomes a total of a 30 millihenry coil. So you can again make up any value of <coughs> inductance by putting the various coils in series. Surprise, surprise! Remember with resistors, we put them in parallel with each other. <coughs> Now we have a coil of 10 millihenry, and we have another coil of 10 millihenry. Can we use the same formula as we did with resistors in parallel? Exactly. Remember I said if you have two inductors or resistors in parallel and they're each of the same value, you can calculate it very easy by taking the value of one divided by 1, 2. So now the total inductance of this coil combination is 5 milliamp. So if you uh, on the exam get a question like that, you treat it the same as you do with resistors in series and parallel. You don't see too often inductors put in series and parallel combinations. You do see that more with resistors. But the formula is exactly the same. And the units you're supposed to use for, for the formula? Yeah, for sure. Bring it back to Henry's? Well, this was millihenry. Okay. If you want to make it into Henry's, you have to divide it by a thousand. Okay, but it's, so it's okay to use it in Henry's. Oh, yeah, you can use Henry's, you can use millihenry's. As long as you, when you do the calculation, you cannot have this one in millihenry and that one in Henry. Okay, so you've got to the make them so they're both in the same. Let's call it denomination. It's the same with resistors. If you have a resistor of 100 ohm and one is one kilo ohm, you cannot do that. Well, in a special way you can, but you're best off to change that kilo ohm into 1,000 ohm. So you've got now 100 ohm in parallel with a thousand ohm resistor, and you do that special calculation, the formula. So generally speaking, when we do our formulas and we do our calculations, you may have to make sure that everything is the same. I in amps, R for resistance in ohms, and V for volts in volts, not millivolts or kilovolts. If you use kilovolts and kilo ohm, the both in the Ks, the thousand, you can use that as well. And when the, what comes out of that would be kiloamps, of course. But they all have to be the same denominator. <coughs> okay, special inductors uh, on page four or five. You see on the very top, you see uh, inductors A, B, and C. The one in A has a solid line that would be an, an uh, iron inductor or an iron core. And the one number B has a broken line, so that is likely a ferrite core of some sort. And the one number C that has no core at all is called an air inductor. It has only air as in the core as well. So, as I mentioned before, study your book. You know, there's, we can only explain it here, and you can ask questions, but once you read the book, you've got to just study. Okay, how can we, uh, we have special coils, and uh, one coil, now I want this to be in different values, so what can I do? I can make taps on it. And I can have a switch here, and I can have multiple taps. I'm not drawing it very nice, but you get the drift. If I want a very small coil, I just have it in this position. So now between here and there, 
I have a very small inductor. I chose one winding to make it two. If I want a larger inductor, I switch from here, let's say, to there. Now I have a larger inductor. So here we have a variable inductor by using a switch in which we can switch on the various taps of the inductor. So this is in essence a variable inductor with the help of a switch. Now there are special coils that are roller inductors and uh, can't quite draw it that way but let's say it is a, a little wheel here attached and when you turn the coil, the coil is suspended in two bearings and when you turn it the coil rotates but this little wheel sits on the wire and says the coil is wound in a fashion that it progresses forward and when you turn the coil this wheel will move itself forward too so again you have a variable inductor but of infinite range because you can pick any any position on the coil by just turning it so with the switch you are kind of fixed in the various modes but with a roller inductor you can go anywhere along the length of that inductor so you can pick whatever is the best for you, for your situation. And that's a roller inductor. You will find that uh, a lot in uh, when you read about antenna, called antenna tuners. There is no more, it's an antenna matching device, but that's where they use roller inductors. <coughs> okay, we've done inductors in series and in parallel. Now inductors, uh, again we have they're called L, and the inductor, the symbol for an inductor is L. Uh, so L total, or L equal, is L1 plus L2 plus L3 plus Ln. And the N means however many more that can come after. So that's again like in series resistors, you add them all together. And the formula for our inductors in parallel is the same as 1 divided by L total, equals 1 divided by L1 plus 1 divided by L2, etc., etc. Exactly the same as in resistors. So if you know and you're familiar with the formula <coughs> for adding and uh, calculating resistors in series and parallel, you know to do the same thing with the numbers. It just has the same that changes from R to L. So that's, that's one thing that can work to your advantage. Same with inductors in parallel, same as resistors. The R becomes an L instead of one. So that works fine. Uh, transformers, I mentioned that already before, where we have a primary coil and a secondary coil. Why would we use transformers? Uh, you can probably come up with uh, Anybody can give me an example? Yes. To step the voltage up or down. Right. Isolation. All right. Two very good examples. There is various ways we can use transformers to our advantage. First of all, we know if we apply 110 volts to this, and we have the current flowing here, we want to use a piece of equipment here, but we do not want to use it directly into an outlet where it's plugged into because the outlet is grounded, etc. etc. You want it isolated. This winding is 500 windings, and this is 500 windings, and what we get out of here is 110 volts. That's in a perfect world. There is no such thing as a perfect world. Again, we have losses of energy and don't take this literally because in the core it produces heat so we we lose some energy that we want but it is created in the form of heat so it's not lost but it is not the way we wanted it so instead of having 110 volts here you don't have 110 you may have only 108 volts there's there's heat being produced in the winding because the winding itself is a copper wire, it has resistance. So does this one, it has resistance. That all induces some kind of loss. So what to put in? 
is not what you can't get out of there, but it, for our purpose right now, we'll call this a perfect transformer. Now, if we make these windings here only a few, like that, now we get less voltage out of there. And there's a ratio to it. If the primary winding has 50 windings, and let's make this, make it easy, 100 volts. And this one here has only five windings. How do we find out how much voltage we can come out of there? Well, if you have 100 volt and you have 50 windings, you can say, how many volts per winding? That would be 100 divided by 50. That would be 2 volts, correct? Can we understand that? If it takes 100 winding with 100 volts, then one winding would be 100 divided by 50 windings, and you get 2 volts per winding. Now, if we have 5 windings here, how much voltage would we get? We get 5 windings times 2 volts per winding, so now we get 10 volts. What's the relationship? 50 and 5 is a relationship of 10 to 1. What's the relationship here? 100 and 10 is 10 to 1. And there you have just checked yourself and made sure your calculation was correct. The ratio between the primary and the secondary, the voltages should have the same ratio. Okay? Now, they also, in the book, come up with examples, and they don't exactly talk about a ratio of uh, 10 to 1, or, but they may even talk about a ratio of 20 to 5. Well, you can do the same thing. Um, you do your calculation that way. In the book, they use a different formula, and I never remember it, because it says E secondary divided by E parallel, is n secondary divided by n parallel. You know, it's kind of a little bit of cryptic. But if you just use logic, and you can approach it the way I did, you can figure it out. Is that not primary? Secondary to primary? Yeah. primary. E secondary to e Voltage primary. in the secondary divided by the voltage in the primary yeah. is the same as the amount of windings in the secondary divided by the amount of windings in the primary. And they give you examples page 4-8, uh, to give you examples of that. Um, I usually do it that way. You can, if you wish, you can remember the formula. I always have a hard time remembering formulas, especially those things. So I just approach it logically and calculate how much voltage per winding. Because they got to give you something. They got to give you the input voltage and the amount of windings here. And then they give you the windings here and ask you to put, create the voltage. Or they give you the voltage here and then they ask you how many windings are there in here. So it's, it's by logic you can come to that very easily. Okay? What time are we doing? Oh, we got a few minutes here. <coughs> Okay, it's the same with the power. We know that in power it is the voltage times the current, E times I, P equals E times I. Well, in this transformer, 100 volts, and you can of course calculate the current once you know the resistance in that, you, you put an amount of power in there. In an ideal transformer, you can get the same amount of power out of it. Okay? But if the voltage is lower here than there, you get the same amount of power, the current has to be higher, right? So you've got to keep in mind, if you have the input voltage higher than the output voltage, to get the same amount of power transfer, the output voltage is lower, but the current will be up, okay? Your book maybe explains it a lot better. Now, as I said, 
inductances are the symbol for inductance is L, and the value of the inductance is measured in microhenry, millihenry, uh, henries, etc., etc. I have this inductor here. Uh, let's take an. Uh, Take this one. It actually has a resistor across it, so it may not measure it properly. Where are the right here? Okay. This inductor, I have a very nice little piece of test equipment here. It has a microprocessor built in. It'll measure inductors, capacitors, and resistors. So I'll turn it on and I'll attach this. to the connections for the wires and I'm going to measure it and see if it comes up with the inductance. It's analyzing and it says 26.45 millihenry. 26.45 millihenry. Remember this is variable. I'm going to change, I'm going to turn this and we'll see what kind of effect that has. Three, two, one, blast up. Okay, it's analyzing. And now it says 20.2 milliampere. So it went down by about six, six milliampere. And that was because we moved the core further out. If I were to put the, move the core further in, again it would change. So uh, you can now see there's proof that by changing the core, how deep it goes inside that coil, we can change the inductance in it. If I measure the inductance of this core coil, <coughs> let's see what comes out of that. Connector will stay on it, that is. What's that thing called? An inductor. No, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's, uh, and the, the brand name is called an, an uh, Atlas. See, it says low resistance and inductance. So it, it has such a low resistance that it actually almost sees it as a resistor, and it was not able to measure the inductance of it. This is called an, uh, an Atlas LCR meter. And it is uh, distributed by a company called Quicksilver, I think Quicksilver Electronics. I expect to pay about 70, 80 bucks for it. But it is, it's very nice. So this inductor has, has a, a quite a low value actually. Um, I can take another inductor here and see if it measures this. This is 20, 20 millihenry, which is a large inductor, and it has a ceramic <coughs> core. And if you if you look close at it, when did I send this thing around? Okay, I'll do that. You can see the windings are actually not very tight together, and there's not all that many of them in there. Let's see if this one is measured. Analyzing, and it says 20.1 millihenry. That's pretty darn good because this one says it's 20 millihenry. So there are pieces of test equipment that will help you go through a junk box of all kinds of inductors you have, not a clue what they are, and this piece of equipment will tell you what they are. So if you're working on a project, an RF project, and you need a core with a certain inductance, you just pick a whole bunch out of your junk box and you start measuring until you find the right one. And it's handy for that. Okay, we'll have a break and then after that we'll go and start talking about capacitors and what else comes with it. 
coffee time, Miller time, or whatever. Oh, <laughs> where's the Miller? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> to magnetism and talked about the coils and like in the scrap yard where it picks up a whole bunch of metal. Well, if you take a loudspeaker, <coughs> this is a very small loudspeaker out of a little, little radio, that works on the same principle. We have a magnet, actually like that, and inside of this is a coil which is attached to the membrane, so this coil actually is glued to this thing here, the membrane, and the cone of the speaker. And when you put through this coil, the music, spoken word, or anything that comes out of your amplifier, it induces a current, it, it produces a current in here. The current varies. But the magnet here is a permanent magnet. So what it does, that coil, which is attached to the membrane, starts vibrating in cadence with whatever the current does. If the current is going from low to a high cu current, excuse me, in a positive way, it may move it out. And when the current goes in the opposite direction, it may draw it in. So the membrane of the speaker, this little membrane, is vibrating in and out according to the music and whatever. And when it does that, it creates sound waves. It pushes and pulls on the air that creates sound waves, hits your ear, and the mechanism in your ear will then convert that again back to sound that you hear. So here's another form of magnetism and inductive induction that works with that. Here you can, I'll send this around and you can see it really well, that little foil in the center, and when you push this, and don't push it too hard, but when you push it up and down, or in and out, I should say, you can see that coil is moving with it into this gap where the little magnet is. And that's a tiny little speaker that I don't know anymore where it came out of. But uh, the same principle <coughs> applies in here as a microphone. You see, this is fairly big. It's the same idea. If, if you talk in front of that thing, your sound waves move that diaphragm up and down because the coil is in a magnetic field, but now the coil is moving up and down, so it's breaking the magnetic lines, and it induces a current in that coil, which represents my voice. Or music, or I, I don't sing. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, we're now going to capacitors. Capacitance and capacitors. What is a capacitor? A capacitor is a device, and the most basic form of a capacitor is two metal plates, and each plate has a wire attached to it, and in between could be air, could be plastic, could be mica, could be a ceramic material, anything, okay? A capacitor has a value, it's called in farad. That is the expression of the capacitor, um, what it can hold, farad. Again, farad is a very, very large figure. So we usually speak more in terms of microfarad. Um, one microfarad is one, one millionth of a farad. Okay? You can also talk about millifarads, even though we don't normally do that. So, one farad is one million microfarad. There's also nanofarads, which are even smaller, and there's also picofarads, which is even smaller yet. On your uh, sheet that I gave you all on the one side with the scientific units, it shows a relationship between farad, microfarad, picofarad, um, 10 to the minus uh, 6, 10 to the minus 9, and 10 to the minus 12. So picofarad is 10 to the minus 12. So, what determines the capacity 
of this capacitor, there's two things. The size of the plates, actually there's three things. The distance of the plates, and what is in between the plates. That determines the size of the capacitor, its capacity to store electricity. So if I want to make this capacitor bigger in capacity, I can do, in this case, two things. This is just air. I didn't put anything in between. Whatever is in between the plates is called the dielectric. You have to remember that. You have to know that. And in this case, it is air, so the dielectric is air. If I were to put mica in here, then the dielectric would be mica. And they have different values, and they do change the value of this capacitor. So in this case, I can make the capacitor larger in capacity by making the plates larger. So if I make this one larger here, and this one. Now the capacitance the capacity of this capacitor is greater because I increase the size of the plates. Another way to do that is by bringing the plates closer together. So if I take this plate and I move it up until it sits like here, then we have much more capacitance as well. So that very easily changes the capacitance of a capacitor. I have a capacitor here, I have a switch here, and I have a voltage source, so we'll call this negative and this positive. Right now it doesn't matter whether it's 10 volt or 5 volt or whatever. What happens if we close this switch? An amount of current will flow from the negative to here, and because it can't go anywhere, because there is a blockage here, that is open circuited, the electrons that have been flowing here, which are attracted by the positive electrons here, will bunch up here on this plate. So this side of the capacitor has a potential of negative electrons, and that side of the capacitor has a potential of positive electrons. Remember, like poles repair, repel, negative and negative repel each other, positive and positive repel each other. In magnetic field, north and north repel, south and south repels. Unlike poles attract. Negative and positive will attract, north and south will attract. So, these electrons, since the current started flowing, they can't go anywhere, they all bunch up here until to a point that the electrons have all congregated on this plate and there are no more left to go on here. Now what it is called is this capacitor is charged. It actually has a voltage between the two plates, a voltage potential, and that is almost equal to the voltage on the battery. If we, that is, if we close the switch, that's when it happens. So once we've done that, we open the switch, the battery is disconnected, you say, okay, now that's it. Well, it's not. We still have that congregation of negative electrons on this side and positive here. They try to attract, they try to get to each other, but they can't because this dielectric in between does not allow the current to flow. So, two important things. Now this capacitor is charged. It has a voltage across its terminals. Secondly, since it is a DC voltage, a DC current, it blocks a DC current. It won't let it go through. So the capacitor is charged. It will not allow DC current to flow through the capacitor. So the capacitor is a blockage for a DC voltage. Now, what happens? I'll take the battery out and I'll short these two together. The switch is still open. Now we close the switch and now the electrons here, which are numerous, 
are trying to go back to the positive to equalize it. So they rush back from here through the wire to the positive side until there is an equilibrium and both capacitor plates have the same amount of charge, the curve stops and that's it. So we now at first charge a capacitor. We took the voltage source away, closed the circuit, closed the switch, now they equalize itself, now we have what we call discharged the capacitor. Okay, everybody can understand that, make sense? Just a question, like when you discharge a capacitor, can you discharge it just by shorting the terminals or should you do it slower? Well, you can, yeah. Does one hurt the capacitor by well, discharging that quickly? I'll, I'll show you that later. Okay. It all depends, but yeah, normally with smaller capacitors you don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, if you have huge capacitors, like several firewalls, you could probably have a current flow of a couple of hundred amps yeah. for a very brief moment. But uh, they, they're, they're quite powerful. Yes. Oh, when I was a kid, I took apart a camera. <laughs> yeah, the capacitor, and definitely had some issues today. Oh, the capacitor yeah. for the, 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 the flash bulb. Yeah. Yes, no. yes. Yeah, capacitors, of course. Experience. I was talking about a small voltage here, but you can charge a capacitor with a battery that would be like 300 volts. And they charge the capacitor and there's 300 volts on it. When I was in Holland in uh, technical school, and uh, we, uh, we actually uh, tricked the teacher while he knew about it, but uh, we charged the capacitor with about 150 volts and then we put it in his pocket. <laughs> you can imagine when you put an end in the pocket and you touch the terminals, they got it in the shop. But I'm sure he's gone through that many times. Okay, a capacitor, I have one that I cut into pieces. How do we make a capacitor? You know, two plates is not very impressive, right? But this, this is the symbol of a capacitor. It's two conducting materials with a dielectric in between. And depending on the type of dielectric material, it changes the value of that capacitor. And remember that. Learn that the three important things that you can do to change the value of a capacitor increase the size of the plates, change the distance between the two plates, and or change the dielectric in between the two plates. All these factors change the value of a capacitor. Now, how do I make a larger capacitor? Well, I have bunch of plates here and I'm going to draw only five of them and I connect all these together and I put a wire on it. Now I take four or five other ones. One, two, three, four, and I can put one here but let's stop there. Connect these together. Now you can see that the plates here and the plates there, they're not touching each other. They're all separated by air or whatever dielectric that was in there. But what we effectively did, we changed the size of the plate many times over. Because we have taken a bunch of plates, connected them together, and we stuck them in between another bunch of plates that are connected together. So now we have one capacitor with two huge plates. So physically, the way they make them is they, they have a roll of paper and a roll of material here and another roll of paper and another roll of metal and another one, etc., etc., etc. And they roll that up and that's how you get a roll, like a toilet roll, but every, every second roll is of different material with an insulation in between. And this capacitor, I destroyed it. And when you look closely, you can see the layers of the various plates. And you, get, you each get to see, and this is the one that I cut in half. And it's kind of hard to see, but I, that are all concentric layers of metal with the concentric layers of insulators in between. So, to keep the capacitor small in size, but the value becomes greater, and they, so that's how they do it. Uh, there is all kinds of capacitors are 
ceramic capacitors. And a ceramic capacitor. Here is it's Mallory, which is the manufacturer's name, but I'm not quite sure what type of capacitor it is. They're all different types of capacitor. In the older radios, back in the 40s and the 50s and the 30s, they had radios and the capacitors in there were little blocks like this, and they had a color code on it. The same as, excuse me, resistors, and the color code would tell you what the value of the capacitor is. So this is an AeroVox capacitor made in Canada. I bet you this thing is probably 40 or more years old. And then we have electrolytic capacitors. And electrolytic capacitors also have plates on each side, but in between for dielectric they have a chemical compound. And that chemical compound um, it's especially made so that it can charge and hold large amount of electrons. And this is an electrolytic capacitor and the way you can tell 99.999% of the time what an electrolytic capacitor is, you see one like this, mostly tubular, and on the one side it is metal, where the wire is attached to, it's the negative side, and the other side it is insulated and the center conductor is the positive side. So this one is polarity sensitive. You hook this up to the negative of the battery and this to the positive and it gets charged up. If you were to do it well, lots of times in reverse mode, you'd probably end up destroying it. And if you were to put way too much voltage on there, uh, what is it rated at? 20 volts? 550? Uh, 50 volts. 50 volts. If I were to put 200 volts on that, the thing will just go blow up. And the end, the end will just come out, and then you will get messy stuff, chemical. So these comes in all sizes and values. Uh, that one is probably uh, 200 microvolt, microfarad or something. One thousand. One thousand microfarad. Okay. Here's one that's only 50, 50 microfarad. It's the same configuration. It's just much smaller. And here is a very small capacitor. And it is measured in, I think it's just 10 nanofarad, I'm not 100% sure. I can read it. That's a small ceramic capacitor. There's all kinds of different capacitors, paper capacitors, mylar capacitors, silver micor, silver micor, micro capacitor, mica, sorry, silver mica capacitors, electrolytic capacitors. Um, Tantalum capacitors, which is a more modern capacitor. It's like an electrolytic capacitor, but much smaller because it uses ceramic materials. Can you measure them on the four meter? Yeah, I can. Uh, but if you chart it, when you measure the size. Uh, oh, just one. Oh, yeah, you can measure the voltage on it. As a matter of fact, I remember I, I showed you earlier that you can actually charge a capacitor so that it holds a voltage. <coughs> I showed you with the two plates and you have it hooking a battery up to it. Well, this, what's that? Did you show that? Yep. The very first explanation of me of a capacitor were two plates and yeah. I drew a power source and a switch. Right. Yeah. And then when you close the switch all the negative electrons will bounce oh, okay. up on one yeah. plate. I thought you were show it. Oh, no, no, no. no. These are all fairly small capacitors that I showed around. Here's another capacitor. It's a bit bigger. It is 64,000 microfarad. This is an electrolytic capacitor. 64,000 microfarad. 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 That's a big capacitor. If any of you have a big truck and you have a 400 watt power amplifier in there to, with a boom box to blow your ears out, you know. Uh, a lot of them have this big capacitor hooked up at the battery or at your amplifier, and it is a capacitor that could be two or three or more farad. It's a huge capacitor. What it does, it holds a, a big charge. And if your amplifier, all of a sudden, I have a, a period where the base comes in really deep, that draws a huge amount of current. 
that capacitor will at that moment instantly supply the extra current that your battery cannot deliver. That's what that huge capacitor does. You probably pay 150 bucks for the capacitor. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You do. Yeah. Right. Well, it makes sense because, uh, like, base, same thing with vinyl record, it takes so much more power to yeah. amplify the base. Uh, right. Here is a capacitor that came out of a very special power supply that I dealt with at the OPP. And uh, we replace those capacitors every so many years, and that's why I ended up with a couple of them. It is an electrolytic capacitor. It's only 60,000 microfarads, which is not really any bigger than this because this is 64,000. But because it's much larger, it can withstand a higher voltage. This has a capacity of 75 volts. So you can charge this up to 75 volts. This one is maximum surge is 30 volts. So you should not apply a voltage on here more than 30 volts. Uh, ideally, 20 volts. Because the surge voltage is the high peak of the voltage. So what would be the you know, actual use for that? What, what, why would they put that in the circuit? What's the purpose? You, I'll, I'll briefly explain that in a moment, but you, when you get to the point of power supplies, yeah. you will discover why you have capacitors yeah. like this. They're used in power supplies. Or to prevent overload. To, well, but actually to, to prevent the ripple current. Yeah. So. Anyway, when I was at home, I, for about five minutes, and it didn't have to be that long, for about five minutes, I hooked this up to my power supply, which I had set at about nine and a half volts. And let's see what is left of it, of that nine and a half volts. It says 6.88 volts. Oh, sorry, I put it at seven volts. So it says 6.88 volts. So since about, we left at 2.30, Marianne? Since about quarter after two, I charged this up at about seven volts. And now it's at six point whatever. So there's still a charge in there. It held this charge in here because of those two plates. All these negative electrons on the one plate trying to get to the other one, which it can. So it is charged. I can prove that. Besides, I just like your finger for it. Oh, this is an LED. <laughs> This capacitor has enough voltage in it that it will light up those three LEDs. How long will that stay on? If I leave it on, maybe 15 minutes, I'm not sure. Originally, these are for 6 volts. Uh, when I charge it at 12 volts and I hook it up, it's really bright. Mm -hmm. so, but you can see now that we are using this current, the voltage that is charged. Because look, now we are at 2.9, 2.88. 2.84, 2.78, so the voltage is dropping because the charts that are stored in here is now being used up by these light seeds going down. This is originally for 6 volts, so now we're talking 2 volts. So, here's proof that you can charge a capacitor and it is not a battery. Don't be mistaken. Some people say, oh, they have a battery. No, we do not. We all have a capacitor that holds a charge. And the moment we touch it together, uh, which one shall I use? No, I'll use this one. There's not much left in it anymore. There was a little spark. Okay, we're going to charge this back up. We're going to use a little bit higher voltage. That's about uh, 50 volts. Now, if you see the meter here, Okay, you see the meter deflected? It is showing that there is a current flowing because I can restrict the current in here to a certain value. And this is such a large capacitor, it takes a finite time for this capacitor to get charged with enough electrons to stop the current flow. Still going. So there's still current flowing. And it will keep on flowing until the charge in the capacitor approaches the same value as the power, the voltage coming out of this charge. Can I make this go faster? Sure, I can increase the current flow. Okay, there we go. It's now charging at about uh, 16 milliamps. 
It's still charging. Can you see the meter? Still charging. Now let's make it a bit faster. We're going to increase the current. Okay. Still charging. It's now going at about 80 milliamps. So it's going to take a while for this capacitor to get charged up because this is such a huge one. Ah, there it's going down. See? The current is going down, the meter needle is going down. That means that this capacitor now is getting to the point of being charged. Theoretically and practically, a capacitor will never, ever, ever come to a full charge. As it approaches a more of a charge, the current will drop, as you can see. So it charges it up a little more, and now the current drops further. Charge it up a bit more, the current goes down even further. So theoretically, there is a, an infinite time period before the capacitor would be 100% charged. It can. But in practice, we say a capacitor is considered fully charged when the voltage in there reaches 0.64 of the voltage of the supply. So if we supply 100 volts to it, once the voltage on the capacitor reaches 64 volts, then it is considered fully charged. Now it could be 0.6 or 0.64. It, uh, it may not show up in this book here. If you were to study for the advanced class, it would definitely be in there. Okay, we've charged this up now at a maximum. Let's see how much is the voltage on here. It says 49.6 volts. Okay? Now we've got a good supply in here. Uh, where is my... Yeah, right. Oh, this is the one. You can see the forest for the tree. I have to see which one is the one that's burned. I bet you I got the wrong one. I've used other ones. Well, I said a capacitor can hold a, a tremendous amount of charge. Since this is a large capacitor that can hold a voltage up to 75 volts, it holds a lot of charge. So now I'm going to short the terminals, and I said on a large capacitor there's a tremendous amount of current that flows. Okay. Whoa. Now instantly I discharge the capacitor. And you can imagine, according to what you saw and what you heard, you can turn it on. There was a lot of current flowing. See the end of the crocodile clip? It's, it's, it's melted, as a matter of fact, again. You can pass it around. It's actually a bit melted. To be, uh, it's like a welder. So, now this capacitor still, I use it exclusively for the class. It's been many times it's been discharged, you can see the black spot. So, so that proves that the capacitor can hold a good charge. All righty. Not to roll the excitement. Mm -hmm. What kind of capacitors we had, I had mentioned already the various ones. Also, there are capacitors that are variable. You have, now physically you can see there's a bunch of plates that are fixed. There's a bunch of plates on this axle and when you turn it, they go in between the fixed plates, and as you put more and more of these plates inside each other, the capacitance will increase. Okay? Play with it. Here's a similar idea, but it is much smaller. So you can all get to see the big one and the small one. Now if you want a real good capacitor, a large one, look at this one. See the size, the, diff diff the uh, differences in the plates and the distance between the two plates. What do you think this capacitor can do because the, diff the size of the plates and the distance between the plates is so large? What do you think this capacitor, besides the fact that it is variable, 
that it can change the capacitance from about 20 microfarad or 20 picofarad to about 250 picofarad? Well, first of all, it's air dielectric, which is considered one. Secondly, the distance between the plates means it can withstand a very high voltage. You can imagine if you have a capacitor with the plates very close together and you put a high voltage on it, there comes a point that the voltage will, will break down the dielectric between it like air and it just jumps a spark like we did there. And uh, it would short the capacitor. Well, this one can probably withstand, well, probably, I know it withstand about 3,000 volts. And this is a variable capacitor that is used in a power amplifier that can run about 2,000 watts. Please don't drop it, because it came out of a matching unit that I have to repair. Uh, last week I talked about uh, meters from Harbor Freight. This is a uh, typical example. They sell, if they're on special, they go for about $4.50. And it's a meter that uh, can measure AC volts, 750 volts, and 200 ranges, and from 200 millivolts up to 1,000 volts in DC. It measures resistance. It measures amps, current from 200 microamps to 200 milliamps and also 10 amps. And it will also test transistors. There's little transistor socket in here. And like I said, and they're special. They go for about less than five bucks. The regular price of these, I think, is about seven dollars. And very often they have a there's two types. This one here, this is one that I use quite often at home. And the disadvantage of these things, they're cheap. And everything is cheap. The cords too. The, the cord broke on the inside, so I had to take it apart and solder it. And it's a mess, but it still works. And uh, this one, when you turn it on, it has an LCD display. It's large enough. It's fairly easy to see. This one here costs, I think, one or two dollars more. It's got a little push button, and you can use that in the dark because when you push the button, it shows the display becomes amber, and then it times out so it doesn't drain the battery too much. So there's no excuse for anybody not to have a multimeter. This, of course, uh, the one that I have here is an industrial one. It's a lot more expensive. I think this was about 150 bucks. And there are meters now that are much, much more expensive than this. If you take a, a reputable, very reputable company like Tektronix or a Hewlett Packard, their test equipment is very expensive. Alrighty. So we've gone through that. I, I gotta kind of hurry up now, I think. Um, we can put capacitors, light resistors and inductors, we can put them in series and in parallel. Remember I said if I want to make a capacitor bigger, uh, let's say I have two capacitors here. If I want to put them in parallel, and I do that like this, doesn't matter where I put the connections, I put two capacitors in parallel, in, in, in reverse to with resistors and inductors, capacitors in parallel add up. And can we, we can easily see why we effectively put those two plates together. Now it becomes one big capacitor. So if you have a capacitor, let's say it's one microfarad, and I increase each plate twice in size, now I have a capacitor of two microfarad. That's the same as putting two capacitors of one microfarad each in parallel with each other. So in capacitors, to increase the size of the capacitor, you put them in parallel, which is the opposite of with resistors and inductors. Now, capacitors in series, here's one capacitor, now we connect another capacitor to it. In series, what you essentially are doing is physically make the size of each capacitor's plates in half. So 
So capacitors in series, the total capacitance becomes smaller. And everybody understand that? And if you don't, like I said, a little bit of religion, you just have to believe it, that it is so, and accept it. If I want to make this even smaller, I put another capacitor in series. Now if this one is 3 microfarad, and this one is 3 microfarad, and this one is 3 microfarad, can anybody make a guess for me as to what will be the end result? One. Exactly. One. It's the same formula as resistors in parallel. If you have three of them in series, the resultant capacitance is the value of one divided by one, two, three capacitors, it becomes one microfarad. So it's the same formula except with capacitors, it's the other way around. You know what I mean? Clear on that? Okay. Other than that, the formulas are exactly the same. <coughs> except instead of R, or instead of like with inductors L, the symbol changes to C for capacitors. Now why would we do that? Capacitors in series or capacitors <coughs> in parallel? Well, you've got this beautiful tube amplifier and uh, the power supply has a couple capacitors in there and all of a sudden one of them blows up. So you find out that it is a capacitor that may be 45 microfarad, 45 microfarad, a microfarad is mu f, even though mostly it is a small f, that is 45 microfarad. And you uh, blow that one up, now you've got a regulation because tonight you're going to have a concert or a, whatever and you've got to have that amplifier operational. But you do not have a 45 microfarad capacitor in your junk box. How can you make a 45 microfarad capacitor? Assuming that it has to be exactly that value. But you've got two capacitors of each sure. 90 microfarad. So what would you do to make a 45 microfarad capacitor? Put them in parallel. Ah. A series. Uh, a series. Right. Put them in series. So now with 290 microfarad capacitors in series, make it into a 45 microfarad capacitor. Now I would not hesitate to leave the 45 microfarad capacitor out and just put the 90 microfarad capacitor in there instead, providing it has the same voltage rating. If this one is in a two-type amplifier, it may be maybe 300 volts, working voltage, WV. If this one has 300 volts or more, you can use it. But suppose because it's a larger microfarad capacitor, a larger capacity, it now is only 250 volts. Would you want to use that by itself? No. No, because it is smaller than this. You do not want to take that chance because it may blow up. But if you've got two of them and you put them in series with each other, now you get a, a capacitor of 45 microfarad and you add these together, which has a voltage rating of 500 volts. Well, I can safely use that, no problem. So capacitors in series, the capacitance goes in half if they're both the same value, but the voltage rating doubles of what they are. If the one capacitor is 90 microfarad and 100 volts, and the other one is 90 and 250 volts, you put it in series, you get in total, uh, what is it, 350 volts. So you're still okay. So there comes in the advantage of putting capacitors in series and or parallel. So you got a junk box full with all kinds of capacitors, well, you can help yourself when one of them blows up in your amplifier and you don't have the exact value, you can make it up. Okay, everybody any questions about that? All right. I've already said the factors that are affecting capacitors, the size of the plates, the distance between the plates, and also the dielectric in between. On page 4-14, you see in the middle of the page an, uh, a table there that says a material glass, mica, polyethylene, polystyrene, quartz, and teflon. The figures you see on the right hand side, it's called the K value, is the value of the dielectric. Air has a dielectric value of one. So that means that mica 
has a dielectric value from 4 to 9, depending on what type of mica, how dense it is, etc. Let's take one with one value. Polyethylene has a capacitor, has a dielectric value of 2.3. That means that because of it being 2.3, the dielectric is 2.3 times the dielectric of air. So that changes the value of the capacitor. Okay? Now you do not necessarily have to remember those dielectrics as long as you remember that the dielectric, when it changes, it also changes the value of the You may have a question on the exam, and the, the questions on the exam are multiple answer. There's one question, read the question slowly, read it again, and make sure you understand the question. Some of them are not necessarily trick questions, but you can get, you can get fooled by them. And then you go and look at every answer. And if you have done your studies, etc., you should be able to pick out the one with the correct answer, even though some of them make, may sound correct, but not necessarily the right one. So you may have an, uh, a question in there about what increases the, or what determines the size of a capacitor. And there may be the one says, put a piece of wood in the train, or, uh, uh, you know, I dump it in a glass of water. And another one may say, increasing the plates and change the dielectric. And then the, another one may say, all three. And you've got to pick the right one. So don't be fooled, be careful. All righty, the formulas for the capacitors, same as for resistors, except it's the other way around. Reactants. Ah, here we come to uh, reactants. Resistors have resistance. Uh, inductors, like coils, they have resistance as well. Copper resistance, what you expect to find in any piece of wire. But, remember I said that when you apply a current through here, that it opposes the start and the buildup of the current. It creates an extra resistance to it. That's called reactance. So in inductors, the reactance is called XL. L is for inductors, and it's inductive reactance. For capacitors, it has the same thing. It has also an, in, an, uh, an inductance, but because it is a C, we call it XC. So this is inductive reactance, and this is capacitive reactance. Remember when we had an AC current flow, it would oppose it, and when the current goes down to zero again, it tries to keep it going. That's all part of the inductance. What do you think what happens if the AC current is 50 hertz, like our line frequency? It opposes it at a certain amount that creates an inductive reactance. Let's say it's 300 ohms. The inductive and capacitive reactance is also called in ohms, okay? Just like with resistance. What do you think would happen if I increase that res the frequency from 50 hertz to 300 hertz? Now, these cycles of the AC voltage from zero to max to zero to max the opposite way and back to zero, they're happening six times faster than they do here. That increases the inductive reactance because it makes it a lot more difficult for that current to go through there because the changes in polarity happen much faster in 300 hertz than it is in 50 hertz. So the inductive reactance goes up as the frequency increases. Remember that, maybe something like that on the course. So that will generate more heat too. No, yeah, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It, again, because you are creating a magnetic field, which when you go back down to zero, that magnetic field collapses and induces a curve again in the same direction as the curve is going. Uh, the inductive reactance, there's no power generated in that. Only in what they call IR losses. 
done it, but with inductive reactants and capacitive reactants, there's no power created and lost. Anyway, um, so the higher the frequency, the more inductive reactants we have. What's the formula for XL inductive reactants? Equals uh, 2 times pi times F times L. That's always the same. Pi is always the same. So we can call that 6.28. We know that pi is 3.14, blah, 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 blah. We just use 3.14. So 2 times pi is 6.28 times the frequency has to be in hertz. <laughs> L is the inductance, has to be in Henry's. So here again, that you've got to keep always that the same. In this formula, frequency is in Hertz, inductance is in Henry's. You can use micro Henry's, but you've got to convert that back to Henry's. So one micro Henry, Henry is one million of a Henry. So you put down one million for L. So if you were to calculate that, you can actually find out what the inductive reactance is in ohms. So as the, the reason that when the frequency increases, the inductive reactance becomes larger, you can see that right here, F. The frequency, make it larger, the result of this formula becomes larger. The same as L, if you make the inductance larger by a bigger coil, put the windings tighter together, put a core in there, the inductance of the coil goes up, so H for Henry becomes larger, that also increases the XL. Okay? All right. Now with capacitors. We get essentially the same thing, except it is what? Opposite. In the capacitor, remember I said it is a blockage for DC. The capacitor, when we apply a DC voltage to it, it charges up. Once it's charged up, it sits there. Nothing else happens. The current stops flowing, and we can disconnect the voltage source, and the capacitor is charged, as we've seen on there. But make this an AC. So let's put this on an AC voltage. So in the positive portion of the AC voltage, the capacitor starts charging up. Okay? Now the voltage starts to go down to maximum and the current and starts to go down. So now since it starts to go down the voltage, these will actually try to equalize. Then all of a sudden, it reverses itself. So now these are going quickly going to the other side, and now the negative charge will be on that side and the positive charge on here. So even though this is open, it, ap it appears as if the AC voltage goes through it. It doesn't go through it, it just cycles back and forth back and forth because the polarity changes all the time. So seemingly a capacitor will pass an AC voltage. It doesn't, it doesn't pass through it, but it allows it to go back and forth and charge and discharge, charge and this one. So it looks like as if it is going through it. Now, when we increase the size of this capacitor, it makes it easier. When we increase the frequency of the AC, it makes it easier. It goes back and forth just more rapidly. So it appears when the frequency increases as if the capacitor provides less resistance to the flow of the current. So what is the formula for capacitors with the capacitive reactants, Xc, is 1 divided by and then we get 2 pi, 6.28 times F times inductance. <coughs> the frequency goes up, 
we divide that into one, and this goes higher, it becomes smaller, so the resistance becomes less. The, the capacitive reactance in ohms will become less. And this again too, frequency in hertz, and the H, the inductance in Henry. <coughs> capacitive reactance. Did I say inductive no, reactance? capacitance though. That's right. capacitive reactance. X and C. Oh. Yeah, this, oh, you're, yeah, you're right. Capacitance. Yeah, I know what you mean now. Here. Okay. You're observant. Okay, that's the capacitance in ferrite. I'm not sure how to spell it. I think it is like that. <coughs> 6.28 times the frequency of the AC, whether it's 50 hertz or 3 million hertz, times the value of the capacitor in para. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, any questions about that? Read through it again in that chapter. It'll explain it again. But as the frequency increases, or if the capacitor increases in size, the, the, the capacitive reactance becomes less. Because whatever this calculation is, it, you do divide it into one. Well, if this becomes larger, and you divide it into one, this becomes less. The resulting answer will become less. One divided by 50 is larger than one divided by 100, right? So that's what it is. So the bottom part of the formula is the same as for inductors, except the C changes, of course. But for capacitors, it is 1 divided by 1. Impedance. I'm not going to go through the impedance part of it. I don't think that you will get any questions on the exam about the formulas of that, but try to remember it, that you read it at least. I want to explain resonance, which is the last part of this chapter. I have a graph here. And along here, <coughs> Excuse me, we have frequency, and along here we have, uh, sorry, this here is the frequency. In this direction, and here we have XL in ohms. Again, XL and XC. Inductive reactants and capacitive reactants is measured in ohms. If we started out with a DC voltage right here for a capacitor, it would be infinite, the resistance. Because once the capacitor is charged, the current stops, there's no more current flow, so it is the same as if you have a very high resistance right here. With the capacitor uh, with an inductor we have a very low resistance in DC okay so we start off with this here if we increase the frequency from lower to higher with the inductor the inductive reactance the resistance in other words goes up higher and higher remember when we increase the frequency that formula then the, uh, the uh, inductive reactors becomes larger. Capacitor, we have the one divided by the formula. So if we increase the frequency, that will become less. So in DC we have this here. And when we increase the frequency, the inductive reactors becomes less. So this is the frequency, let's say this was zero hertz which is DC. Let's say here we have one megahertz. So you see as the frequency frequency goes higher, the inductive reactance goes up, but the capacitive reactance goes down. 
because that opposes less resistance to it. You see at a point here, they both become equal. If this was, that make it five ohms at this point, here it is infinite, and here it was zero, at this point we have five ohms. So the capacitive reactor, Capacitive reactants and the inductive reactants cross each other, they're equal, but they are opposite in polarity. Take that as religion, okay? They are both equal in value, but they are opposite in position, in, in value. What happens if you have two values the same but opposite polarity? What happens? They cancel each other. So at this point, they both cancel each other, we have no resistance there, and we can have a high current flow. This point is called resonance. With a inductor in series with a capacitor, or an inductor and a capacitor in parallel, if you vary the frequency of this circuit at the point that the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactants are equal with their opposite, they cancel each other, and in this circuit you get a very high current flow because essentially there's only the resistance in the copper water. <coughs> Same here. When they both reach the same value, but opposite in, 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 uh, in polarity, let's call it, then the current through here is very high. And all we have is the losses of the copper resistance in there. And that is called resonance. Now, if, you, if this was tuned to a frequency of 1.2 megahertz, and that probably would be uh, a frequency of a broadcast station. What would you do if you want to go to 1.5 or 0.8 megahertz, a different frequency to pick up another station? What would you do? You can vary either the inductance or the capacitor. So if you make this a variable inductor, that you can change the size of the coil, you change the inductive reactants and the resonance point will now change. It may sit here instead of over there. This is a different frequency. So by changing the inductive reactants, by making this a variable inductor, or you make this a variable capacitor, that you can change the capacitance, like the one here that you twist and change the capacitance, you change the resonance frequency and that's how you can tune the different stations on your receiver. Or in case of a transmitter, you change the frequency of the transmitter. So this is a tuned circuit, a parallel circuit. This is a tuned circuit, a series circuit. And at a given value of inductor and capacitor, you get a resonance frequency. So the two things you've got to keep in mind Resonance frequency is the point where the inductive and capacitive reactants become equal but opposite. Alrighty? That's it. Read it through. And as uh, I mentioned before, I will not be here on Thursday. We had an, uh, a death in family. My brother-in-law passed away, so we're going to go to the kitchen tomorrow. We won't be back until next week. So Thursday, next week, Thursday, I'll see you and we'll talk about transmission lines. And it will be maybe a bit more interesting.